Hello and welcome to ENI UK and Europe Edition. I'm Kate Rodriguez reporting from Brussels, Belgium. We're bringing news reports from the United Kingdom and Europe. We have live reporters on standby ready to give the reports. And for our headline. G7 health chiefs arrive in Oxford to discuss vaccine sharing and animal diseases. EU puts forward e-wallet proposal. And joined with us, we have Janelle Ankesuda. Hi, Janelle. What do you have for us today? Hi, Kate. My report will be about Princess Diana's wedding dress and how it was one of the best kept secrets in fashion history. In Italy, we have uh, Italy starts to ease restrictions. And for our health, the eating and importance of keeping cold. And for sports, we have Giancarlo Matera. Hi, Giancarlo, what do you have for us today? This week to report on the finale of the European club football calendar, which is the UEFA Champions League final. And to end our program, we have our view from our window. In Eckernfada, Germany, a port city in the Baltic. Health ministers from the G7 group of wealthy nations met Thursday in Britain to discuss sharing vaccines with poor countries as calls continue to ensure fair global distribution of doses. The meeting in Oxford in Southern England comes ahead of next week's G7 summit hosted by the United Kingdom, which is said to be dominated by discussion of the coronavirus pandemic and recovery plan. UK Health Secretary Matt Hancock told reporters they will be working together with G7 partners to try to meet the objective that a vaccine is made available right across the world. He added that this is a global pandemic and nobody is safe from it until everybody is safe. The G7 gathering was also set to focus on improving identification of animal-borne infections, given three-fifths of all infections jump from, the, from animals to humans. The ministers from Britain, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the United States vowed to combat future health threats by working together to identify early warning signs from animals and the environment. The world's wealthiest countries face growing pressure to do more to help vaccines reach poor countries, which do not have enough staff or stocks for comprehensive inoculation programs. The G7 countries are already committed to support the COVAX global vaccine sharing program. France in April became the first country to donate doses from its domestic supply to COVAX with an initial commitment of 500,000 doses. U.S. Sec Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Wednesday President Joe Biden will announce within days plans to export 80 million shots to other countries without any political strings attached. And although Britain, which has ordered more than 400 million doses of various vaccines, has pledged the bulk of excess doses to COVAX, Hancock said it was not yet ready to donate its extra jab. In Europe, uh, your EU citizens could store all their identity documents digitally to be used with the wave of a smartphone or online to be called on whenever an EU citizen needs to prove their identity under a proposal unveiled Thursday by the European Commission. Let's hear the statement from EU Commission Vice President. Each member state will provide citizens and businesses with a so-called digital wallet. Uh, it's like having a secure folder where you can store your identity card, your driver's license, your educational certificates, your marriage uh, certificate. It's like a wallet in your pocket or, or in your bag. The EU Commissioner for Digital Matters, 
Margaret Basager told a news conference that e-wallets could be used as a safer ad-free alternative when logging onto websites offering services. She said that the plan is for e-wallets to become available one year after the EU regulation ends up being passed, which would mean late next year at the earliest. The Stagger added that rollout could be accelerated under a coronavirus recovery package about to distribute hundreds of billions of euros to EU countries. Technical work was already underway, she said, to show EU citizens that the e-wallets cannot be hacked and that you are in control of your data. The proposal is part of a wider, wider approach by the European Commission to boost the EU's transition to a digital future. It has set itself a target of having all public services in the EU available online by 2030 and ensuring that every EU citizen has a digital medical record. Time for a break. ENI UK and Europe Edition will be back. Welcome back to ENI UK and Europe Edition. I'm Kate Rebibis. Interesting stories from around the UK this week. Late Princess Diana's iconic wedding dress takes center stage at a royal fashion exhibition in Kensington Palace. Joining us today on the story is Janelle Ann Kasuga. Hello, Janelle. Hello, Kate. Thank you. And uh, yes, Princess Diana's wedding dress for her marriage to Prince Charles in 1981 was one of the best kept secrets in fashion history. The gown sparked such intense interest that the young designers, David and Elizabeth Emmanuel, locked in a safe at night. The ivory silk dress, which had a 25 foot or 7.6 meter long train. Plucked from obscurity for the commission of a lifetime, the pair even took to putting dummy bits of fabric in the studio's bins to throw anyone rummaging through them off the scent, according to an exhibition of royal fashion, including Diana's iconic dress that opens on Thursday. The exhibition named Royal Style in the Making at the Orangery at Kensington Palace, Diana's home until her 1997 death in a car crash in Paris, focuses on the work of designers who dressed not only Diana, but also Queen Elizabeth II, Princess Margaret, and the Queen Mother. Trimmed with vintage lace and pearls and thousands of sequins, the train of Diana's dress was the longest ever for a for British royal bride and memorably appeared crumpled as she emerged from her carriage at St. At St. Paul's Cathedral. Luckily, the designers were on hand to smooth it out. Kensington Palace curator shares more details on the wedding dress. Let's listen in. So the dress is made out of this wonderful heavy silk taffeta. It was woven in England um, and it's embellished with a, a beautiful Suffolk lace. Um, again, woven in the UK and it was based on lace that had belonged to Queen Mary originally. And we can see around the, um, the collar, the frill in the collar and around the sleeves is the original lace that was worn by Queen Mary at the beginning of the 20th century. So we've got that. Um, and then the colour of the silk, it's an ivory as opposed to a bright white. And that was inspired by Queen Victoria's wedding dress. Queen Victoria was, of course, the first royal bride to wear white for her wedding. And she really set that trend amongst modern brides. Um, so they drew on a lot of historic references, historic royal references, for the design of the dress. Um, and then, and then, but gave it a very contemporary edge with this really sort of iconic 1980s shape. The exhibition, which runs until the 2nd of January, chronicles some of the hard toil behind the dress, featuring photographs of the seamstress as well as the keys for the safe where it was safely deposited nightly. The exhibition also highlights Diana's growing sense of personal style.
an evolution from girlish frills to sleeker, more impactful outfits. With her wedding dress, she kind of left it to us really, Emmanuel had said. But another designer she had a close relationship with, David Sassoon, lent the organizers archive documents that show her getting more involved. She scribbled a comment on one drawing, this in dark blue please, and in a handwritten letter asked for a dress pattern to be alternate, altered. In another video, Sassoon recounted that Diana was very shy when they first met, but later became very hands-on in selecting exactly what she wanted. She understood what the public wanted from the clothes she wore, noting she loved to break the rules, often not wearing gloves or a hat, as royal protocols require. Her son, Princess William and Harry, loaned both Diana's wedding and going away dresses to the exhibition, but the creators do not know whether they are attending. Diana would have turned 60 on July the 1st, and Harry and William are expected to unveil a long-awaited statue of her in a garden at Kensington Palace. The exhibition comes as the princes have recently spoken more about their mother's pain at the end of her marriage and their sense of her legacy. The popular drama series The Clown have also recreated some of her most famous outfits. Sora believes her style is once again being celebrated and her promotion of and work for British fashion designers is really an important story. Back to you, Kate. Thank you so much. So um, Princess Diana has a reputation of being a people's princess with her charitable and humanitarian contributions. Um, she has also been hailed a fashion icon. What makes her style different to others? Well, Kate, the curator for the Royal Fashion Exhibit, Claudia Acott Williams, described Lady Diana as playful, innovative, and she abandoned or lifted the traditional protocols like wearing gloves. Diana also hardly wore hats, and she was the one to introduce wearing tuxedo-style trousers at evening events, which Acott Williams claims allowed Diana to forge her own identity in dress. In terms of her wedding dress, uh, Lady Diana has maintained had maintained a good rapport with the designers as they were young and fresh and fashion forward. They were also only a few years older than she was, so they had a really good friendship. Also, they all had quite similar ideas as to what they wanted the dress to look to convey her transition from a young girl to a princess. Um, Diana's wedding dress, of course, has many historic and royal references, which is patterned together with the iconic 1980s shape. Uh, Williams further says that Princess Diana set a precedent for future royal brides and allowed them to really engage with contemporary fashion trends, as well as traditional motifs of bridal dressing. Kate? Okay, thank you for bringing us the story, Jenna. Thank you for having me. Reporting from London, United Kingdom, I'm Janelle Kasuga. We live in interesting times. Italian res residents enjoy outdoor dining following an easing of coronavirus restrictions across most of Italy. Here's Sabina Valsita to tell us more. Let's watch. After months of heavy restrictions imposed by the government to contain the second and third waves of COVID-19, Italy is hoping that this latest easing will mark the start of something like a normal summer. Restaurants, concert halls, cinemas and gyms partially reopen in a boost for coronavirus hit businesses. As the number of new COVID-19 cases decline, along with the acceleration of the nationwide vaccine rollouts, Italy has started to ease on coronavirus restrictions. After more than a month, precisely on June 1st, while respecting safety distance and wearing a face mask, indoor dining was allowed once again. People who have been vaccinated, recovered from COVID-19, or tested negative will also see foreign travel prohibition lifted thanks to Europe's Green Pass scheme. Tourists are slowly beginning to return, which is a big boost to Italy's economy, as the country relies heavily on external tourism, which suffered a great amount over the past year. 
From Italy, reporting for Eagle News International, I'm Zavina Danielle Balsira. We live in interesting times. Thank you, Savina, for your update in Italy. Time for a break. ENI UK and Europe Edition will be back. Welcome back to ENI UK in Europe edition. I'm Kate Rubibis. Interesting stories in Europe this week. In today's health, Aaron Paul Ortiz, a professional coach specializing in fat loss and fitness, gives them tips on how to burn fat consistently and how to have healthy appetite. Let's watch. Eating and the importance of keeping full. What is going on, everyone? Aaron here. Today, we're going to be talking about the number one key for you to be able to stick to a calorie deficit. So, you know by now that you have to be in a calorie deficit for you to be able to lose fat, which means that you have to burn more than what you're taking in, and you have to consistently do this for you to be able to lose weight and lose fat, right? But the question is, how do you do that? How do you do this consistently and effectively without feeling hungry all the times and without dropping your energy so low? The common mistake that people do is just focusing on the calories itself, just focusing on the quantity of the foods, right? So by the way, you can still lose weight and you can still lose fat when you do this as long as you're in a calorie deficit and without focusing on the quality of the foods. But the thing is, your energy levels won't be there and you are most likely going to be hungry constantly because you are not giving what your body needs. For example, if you are eating 1500 calories, let's make an example of McDonald's. It doesn't have to be McDonald's, it could be like other takeaways as well. And you are burning 2000 calories throughout the day, you still have that deficit, therefore you can still lose fat and you can still lose weight. But you are most likely not going to have the energy that you need throughout the day. Therefore, it's going to be hard for you to exercise and move more throughout the day. And also, you're going to be constantly hungry. You've probably done that before. You have a takeaway or whatever. 30 minutes or two hours later, you're hungry again. That's because you didn't get what your body needs. What is the key then? What is the key when it comes to sticking to a calorie deficit? The key is feeling satisfied after you've eaten your food. There are three ways that you can do that from today. First one is putting vegetable. Have vegetables on each meal that you're going to have from today. That's gonna to allow you to put volume in your food, which will then keep you full after you have that food, which you are most likely not to overeat after that. Second one is having protein on each meal. That's a pound to two pounds of protein on each meal. The reason for that is because protein is the most satiating macronutrient compared to carbs and fats. That means protein will make you feel full for longer compared to carbs and fats, right? Third one is focus on what you can eat rather than focusing on what you can't eat. If you constantly focus on the foods that you can't eat, that means you're going to think about it constantly, therefore you're going to end up having it. So focus on the food that you can eat instead. As we talked about, that's going to be the half vegetables on each meal and also the protein on each meal as well. And also you can focus on the fruits that you have for snacks and everything else, right? To recap, have vegetables on each meal. Second one is having proteins as well on each meal too. That's a pound to two pounds of protein on each meal, right? Third one is focusing on the food that you can eat rather than focusing on the foods that you can't eat, right? So hopefully this video helps. Again, if you got any questions, let me know on my Instagram. Also let me know how your progress is going too. Apart from that, keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you next week. Thank you, Aaron. We look forward to next week's tips. The results of the Football Champions League final held in Porto reveals the best team in Europe. Giancarlo Matera has a report. Hello, Giancarlo. Hello, Kate, and thank you for having me. Uh, the results of the Champions League are that Chelsea have won the biggest prize in club football for the second time in their history as their German striker Kai Havertz's goal secured a 1-0 victory over Manchester City in Porto and in the process shattered Manchester City manager Pep Guardiola's dream of lifting the trophy for a third time. 
Havertz rounded the goalkeeper, Edison, to score three minutes before half-time at the Estadio do Dragao, and the Chelsea players ran to celebrate with him. Chelsea's German coach, Thomas Tuchel, full of energy on the touchline, just like his opposite number, punched the air in celebration, and later jumped with joy on the pitch after Chelsea held on for victory in the second half after City lost their distraught captain, Belgium's Kevin De Bruyne, to injury. Back in England, the London club had finished fourth in the Premier League, a huge 19 points behind the Champions Manchester City. But this, remarkably, was Chelsea's third win over Manchester City in the last six weeks. They had ended Manchester City's hopes of a domestic treble when they beat them in the FA Cup semi-finals in April, and they also delayed their title celebrations with a victory in Manchester. Now, in a final watch by a limited crowd of just over 14,000 fans who created a raucous atmosphere, they have denied City their first Champions League crown, they and Guardiola so crave. Manchester City were the favourites to lift the most prestigious trophy in European football, but Chelsea proved to be the better team on the night, with a gutsy performance, great defending, and a clinical finish. Chelsea celebrated their second Champions League trophy nine years after the legends of 2012. That included all-time Chelsea greats such as Petr Cech, John Terry, Frank Lampard, and Didier Drogba. This team, in contrast, is a relatively young team with a lot of potential to improve. Led by Spanish captain Cesar Espilicueta, a man-of-the-match performance from World Cup winner N'Golo Kante, and a key assist from Englishman Mason Mount. There is great optimism in West London that this Chelsea team is just at the start of a sustained period of success. But for now, Chelsea fans all over the world are happy to celebrate the fact that their team are the champions of Europe. For ENI UK and Europe Edition, I'm Jacquard Matera, and we live in interesting times. Thank you so much, Giancarlo, for that report. And in today's view from our window, we go to a small coastal town in Germany. Eckenforde is a town in northern part of Germany. It is located on the coast of the Baltic Sea with a population of 22,000 residents. The sports city on the Baltic Sea offers long beaches for walks, cycle tours through the pristine countryside, and water sport activities such as sailing and surfing. And for those who prefer being out of water, flying kites. Eckenfada's highlight in the glass candy factory, where you can enter for free to catch sight of how the sugar for the sweet delicacies is boiled in a copper kettle over an open fire which is based on old craftsmanship. This view is courtesy of Irene Juliette Arzadon from our EBC Germany Bureau. Thank you for this view, Irene. And that's it for today's program. Stay safe and keep positive as we bring you more stories next week from the United Kingdom and Europe. I'm Kate Rivivis and we live in interesting times.